Good morning, Chris Ohl, Wake Forest School of Medicine, Infectious Diseases. So the big news today uh, for our COVID update um, is that two days ago it officially became summertime. Um, yeah, it's certainly been hot um, in our area, and uh, so it feels been feeling like summer for a while, but now it's official. So I thought at the end of a, a brief update for COVID. Uh, and COVID vaccination, we'll talk a little bit about how to stay safe with all your fun summer activities since it seems like everybody's back at it this, uh, this summer, which is a good thing. So how uh, house cases and, uh, uh, and COVID going here in the triad region? Um, well, um, I, I would summarize, <clears throat> we have had a wavelet. About two weeks ago, this wavelet peaked. Although when you look at it, this is more like one of those very long rolling waves that comes in at the beach rather than the short high ones. Um, so our cases are coming down, albeit slowly, uh, from that peak two weeks ago. Um, we're at officially at 23 per 100,000 uh, per day now um, here in Forsyth County. Guilford's about the same. Mecklenburg's a little bit higher in the low 30s. Um, and that's uh, a fairly comfortable range. Uh, our hospitalizations um, are hanging in there at kind of a low level, um, and hospitalizations don't change as fast. But it does seem like those hospitalizations here in the triad are dropping somewhat slowly also. Um, so our activity is going down, and that's confirmed by uh, um, our sewage numbers, um, and uh, we're COVID can be picked up and what people excrete, and um, those numbers are also slowly coming down. So all the data kind of points in the same way that this wavelet is decreasing. The variants in this area right now are, um, if you're a variant follower, um, is BA uh, 1.21.1, uh, which is an Omicron um, subvariant um, and has been what's been circulating in the United States now um, since uh, mid-spring. Um, we have been seeing a slow increase of BA4 and BA5, which is a variant that first uh, was identified in South Africa. It's a little bit more transmissible than our other Omicron subvariants that we're seeing. Uh, certainly no more severe, uh, and it's an open question whether it's any more invasive, uh, evasive, so getting around <coughs> our immunity. Probably not much so. So I, I really don't see much of a problem with that variant. Uh, don't see any other variants on the horizon now, but those uh, do tend to come up quickly, so we'll have to keep our eyes open for that. Uh, for in the COVID world, big news is uh, the vaccines are now available for kids uh, between the ages of four and six months. And the safety data uh, for both Moderna and Pfizer, both are available in that age group, uh, is fantastic, actually. Um, the, um, there, are no, there were no severe side effects at all identified in the trials, so no myocarditis, no clots. Um, and the side effects or the things that you might anticipate that could happen from the vaccine um, are less than actually what we see in adults. So kids of that age group seem to tolerate it pretty well. Um, they, uh, the, the main ones that I think some parents have been noticing is the same thing like you see after uh, your kids get other shots. So when you go to the pediatrician and you get your one-year-old shots or 18-month-old shots, kids can be a little bit fussy afterwards. Occasionally they seem a little bit more tired, not quite as active. Um, the older kids who can complain might say they have a headache. Fever is a lot less common than what we see in adults. All of those can be treated, should they occur, with uh, kids' ibuprofen um, and, um, or um, acetaminophen, um, and both of those work to ameliorate uh, the, that if it happens. The efficacy of the vaccine, which is uh, how well it works in that age group, um, seems to be good, including for Omicron, um, and um, about as good as it is in adults. So um, that's also very good news. Um, the um, 
vac the vaccines that are available are either Moderna's vaccine or Pfizer's vaccine. Johnson & Johnson's not available for kids. It wasn't submitted to the FDA to look at. Um, they're a little bit different. Moderna's vaccine uh, is a two-shot series uh, with a reduced um, amount of the antigen um, in the vaccine uh, that causes the immunity to occur compared to adults. And the Pfizer's is a three-shot series. So Moderna's you would get it um, at, uh, at time zero and then between one to two months later. Um, and then Pfizer's vaccine uh, which is a three-shot series, you get at time zero and then at three weeks um, and then a little bit further down the road. Um, there's some wiggle room with the last shot um, for Pfizer's vaccine as to when you get it. They, uh, uh, efficacy-wise, um, Moderna's may be a little bit um, better as far as generating an immune response, um, but both vaccines are good. Um, and um, if you were going to look for Moderna and they say, well, we only have Pfizer today, I'd just go ahead and get Pfizer. I don't think the differences make that, are that much different um, in order to delay vaccination. Um, <clears throat> get asked a lot, you know, so the vaccine's safe, looks like it works, but should I really get my vac kids vaccinated? And so I hear the following questions. One, I thought that COVID wasn't that severe in kids. So why vaccinate for it? Well, um, that's true. It's not as severe in that age group as kids as it is in older people um, or people with underlying health problems. Uh, but we still see, uncommonly, but we still see hospitalizations and rarely deaths uh, in that group. Uh, in fact, if you look at it right now, for all of the vaccine preventable diseases that we think about in kids, Measles, mumps, um, whooping cough, um, pneumococcal infections, which is a bacteria, meningitis. Um, right now, more kids are getting COVID and having serious effects and deaths from COVID than any of those others. So of all the vaccine preventable diseases that are out there, the one that's causing the most deaths right now is COVID. So if you look at it from that way, it would say, yeah, you know, if I'm gonna immunize my kid for meningitis, I'd never think twice about not doing that. Then why not do it for COVID? It's actually more likely right now. Um, the second thing is, is that um, COVID can be um, disruptive to a family. So if you have a child in day daycare and they get sick, the cold, like some symptoms, you get tested and you're positive, well, you're out of daycare for a while. Um, and then that means you have to arrange uh, different child care and so on and so forth. And then they can bring it home to the family. I've known several families who've gone through COVID as a family lately, um, and most would rather avoid that. Um, and so, uh, so that's another reason to get vaccinated. Um, so, and certainly if you're planning travel of any kind or an activity, uh, it would be a good idea. Uh, to get vaccinated. So we don't know about um, boosters in, um, for that age group yet. Probably would be, will be coming down the road again, maybe six months or so. We'll have to wait and see um, how long the immunity lasts from these vaccines and whether boosting will be necessary. Uh, for the older kids though, who are between uh, the ages of uh, five and 12 or 12 and 18, um, then uh, it's pretty clear the data shows that um, you need three shots. And so that group between five and 12 wasn't able to get vaccinated until last November. So if they've only had two shots since last November, then they need a third one. And I'd go out and get that third one sometime now, around now, uh, especially uh, if your 5 to 12 year old is going to be in, um, in summer activities such as camp, particularly overnight camps. Because uh, I can tell you overnight camps are testing for COVID, having helped a few of them in the last couple weeks um, with their positive tests and what to do. Uh, and, uh, and unvaccinated kids in almost all of these camps who test, uh, who are exposed to somebody who tests positive, you're gonna be asked to go pick them up. 
and uh, vaccinated kids um, who get COVID uh, are going to have to isolate. Some will do it at camp. Sometimes you'll have to go pick them up. So that's pretty disruptive. And so um, if you get your 5 to 12 year old um, immunologically topped off, so to speak, to get the third dose of the vaccine. And again, this vaccine is and should always have been a three dose series for the 5 to 12 year olds, which is Pfizer's vaccine. Then, um, then you should go get boosted. Um, for adults, we've talked about it, um, but just a quick review. Um, if you are um, older, over the age of 65, or have underlying health problems and have had um, two shots, you should go get a third now. If you've had three shots, you should go get a fourth now. Uh, if you're otherwise healthy and not older, probably wait until this fall. It looks like the uh, Omicron uh, specific and Omicron subvariant specific vaccine that Moderna has put into the Pfizer or put into the FDA um, looks very good as far as immunogenicity actually, the early data. Um, and I anticipate that vaccine to be out towards the latter part of the fall of this year. And, um, and we'll be talking more about which booster to get this fall. But I can tell you before the respiratory viral season, we, um, we will be heavily campaigning for people to get a booster, just like we do for the flu shot every late fall. Um, and lastly, are we going to have to put masks on again? Well, I don't see it out in the future right now. Um, it's possible that uh, masking might be needed again uh, when we get into December, January, and February. Um, and uh, so I'd probably get your mind right that that might come out. Will that be the case for every respiratory viral season forever? Probably not. Um, but maybe for this winter yet, because um, um, we're, we're learning some things about these respiratory viruses in the time of, uh, in the time of COVID. Um, and I can tell you, it's a little bit surprising. For instance, we are still seeing a, fairly amount, a fair amount of flu right now. And flu in, uh, in summertime is quite unusual. Um, so somehow COVID pushed the flu out uh, during January and February, and flu kind of said, well, my turn now. So we are seeing flu cases. Um, so that's a, little, that's a little bit about what's going on with COVID in the world. Um, so what about summertime? So um, unlike previous years, most of us uh, have decided that we can travel. Um, we're going to go to the beach. We're going to have family get-togethers. The pool seems pretty darn good when it's really hot out. You know, I haven't been hiking in a couple years, need to get back in shape, let's go out and hike. And, um, and you know, the backyard is still seems really nice, even though I don't have to lock down in it, uh, I still like to have friends over and get out in the backyard. So there's all sorts of uh, nu nuisances and potentially uh, infections one can get um, during the summertime. Um, so let's talk about that. First of all, travel. If you're going to be travel, traveling internationally outside of Europe um, and or developed Asia, such as Japan, if you can get a visa, um, or Canada, uh, you'll probably want to see a travel medicine provider. And um, that's weird. I happen to be one of those. So you can come see me uh, and get your appointment through My Wake Health or, uh, or however else you get your appointments by calling. Be happy to see you and get you all set up, including vaccinations and medications you might need for your travel. Um, and uh, I can tell you, a lot of people are, uh, are doing international travel now and they're having a great time doing it. So, um, so that's one thing to think about for health for the summer. Now, what if it's going to stay domestic? You know, it's like good old North Carolina is good for me. Well, it depends a little bit about what you're going to do. So, Fortunately, most things that people do during the, uh, during the summertime are safe. Um, I can tell you what the number one um, thing that we see in our emergency department um, year-round, but particularly during the summer, are all-terrain vehicle accidents. And I won't go into all the safety for that, but a lot of it just makes sense, right? Um, wear a helmet, 
stay on the track, don't speed, and above all, don't drink an ATV around at the same time. Um, and because uh, ATVs tip over, and when they do, they usually break your leg, oftentimes in two places uh, in the lower part. And uh, that's the better injuries that you can get when these happen. Uh, the beach, uh, the obvious thing, the big thing you want to avoid at the beach is drowning. Um, and uh, again, a little bit of common sense. Pay attention to the riptides. Keep an eye on people. Uh, know your limits. Uh, don't mix alcohol. Um, in excess at the beach uh, when you're out swimming um, and, um, and let's not drown. Um, but there are some other things that uh, can occur at the beach. Um, again, seems fairly obvious. Probably the biggest thing is sunburn. Um, people don't realize it, but you can get pretty sick from a severe uh, and extensive sunburn. Um, and so sunscreen is important. If you're going to beaches uh, closer to the equator, you can burn in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and if you want to uh, prove that, look around sometime uh, at the, uh, on the airplane coming back from like the Dominican Republic or some other Caribbean island and you'll see half the plane is red um, because they burn. Um, so, um, but let's not burn. Um, also, uh, heat and heat stroke, particularly for younger people, um, can be a problem. So keep yourself well hydrated while at the beach. Uh, find some shade, get an umbrella, or come on in during the hottest time. Um, the safest times to be out um, and the most comfortable times are earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon. The sun's not quite as hot um, and, uh, and that's the time to go. There's really not a lot of, uh, of specific infections you can get at the beach. Obviously there's the jellyfish. Um, and things like that. Um, and uh, occasionally you can get pick, some, pick up some stuff from skin exposure to the sand, but that's pretty unusual around here. Um, so um, that, that's the good news part of it. Um, what about um, going to the lake and rivers? Um, well, um, as the summer goes on, um, particularly small lakes and ponds, that are fairly stagnant where you don't have a lot of fresh water um, turning over uh, in the pond um, can have problems with both bacterial overgrowth and then also um, a little amoeba um, called uh, Naglaria. Um, and um, uh, you know when that when infections from that happen they usually hit the media everybody hears about it. They're fortunately very rare and they occur from forceful introduction of water, usually into the nose. And then from where there, that little amoeba gets up to the top of the nose and then can penetrate up into the brain. Um, and that's quite serious. Again, fortunately, they're very rare. Uh, most summers here in North Carolina, we um, don't see any cases. Sometimes we'll see, particularly in the hotter summers, a handful, less than five of these cases. How do you avoid that? One is uh, don't forcefully uh, let water enter your nose. Um, and so think about how that could happen, going down a fast water slide into a small pond or lake. Um, hit the water, water goes up the nose. Um, swinging out on the rope, which is a lot of fun, and then dropping when you drop, water goes up the nose. So if you're gonna be doing those things, put on some no clips or hold your nose, keep the water out of the nose. Um, does it, would I let it interfere with my fun at the lake or the pond? No, probably not, but I might hold my nose if I'm going to swing out on the rope, which would be an interesting thing to see. Um, other things, what about out in the backyard? So uh, the big thing in the backyard, um, I think that can get, uh, that's the biggest nuisance, are mosquitoes. Um, yes, rarely, rarely, rarely mosquitoes can transmit viral infections. Uh, and what we call the encephalitides, uh, and this causes usually a flu-like syndrome. Examples are Eastern Equine and West Nile virus. That usually happens in the later part of the summer or the earlier part of the fall, um, and different years have different activities. Usually if the activities for that go up, we'll let you know um, that they're up, uh, and you can take extra mosquito precautions. Uh, some people, um, go you know subscribe to services where you get your backyard sprayed 
Um, and uh, to tell you the, the truth, and I'll probably take some heat from the spray people, but um, it doesn't work real well. Um, you get a reduction in mosquitoes for a few days, and then they come back. Um, and, um, and so it's really not all that effective. Um, and it's also not very green, because not only are you killing the mosquitoes, but you're killing the ladybugs and all the other good bugs that um, butterflies and such that we would like to keep around. The uh, other thing some people trap, try are mosquito traps that emit CO2 and then the mosquitoes get attracted into them. Um, and some, those don't really work so well either. In fact, some, some studies have shown they actually attract more mosquitoes into your yard, depending on the species and what time of day it is. Um, and bug zappers do work, um, but the distance that they work is right around the zapper, um, so if you're using that on the deck. Uh, how about citronella candles? Um, they really, uh, they really have a nice atmosphere to them. Um, put a bunch of citronella candles out on the deck, uh, and it looks real nice, kind of smells kind of neat, gives you that summertime feel, but mosquitoes could care less. Um, if you have something that smokes, um, such as the um, torches um, or a fire pit, um, smoke will drive mosquitoes away in the area where the smoke is. Um, but 10 feet out away from the smoke, mosquitoes could care less. So, so there's really not a lot of major things you can do to keep the mosquitoes off. So protect yourself. When the mosquitoes are active, and we have two different kinds of mosquitoes in our area here, one that uh, hangs out during the morning time during the day and the late afternoon, that's the 80s mosquito. Um, and then there's mosquitoes that bite at night, mostly the Anopheles. There's others too, but we'll keep it to two and keep it simple. Um, if you, uh, during those time frames, if you wear long sleeves, long pants, you'll keep the mosquitoes off. And you don't have to use repellents underneath your clothing. Uh, a nice hat on the, uh, sometimes helps, particularly with the flies that tend to come around and get in the hair. Um, and uh, if you have a real bad problem um, with mosquitoes, you can put netting up over your face. I've seen some people do that. Most places it's not quite that nasty mosquito-wise to have to put netting over your head. Um, and then you use a good mosquito repellent on your exposed skin. Um, there's basically three mosquito repellents that you can get uh, that are readily available. Uh, the first one contains something called DEET. It'll say right on the ingredients, D-E-E-T, DEET. And that mosquito repellent's been out for a long time. It's safe. It's safe to use on kids, too. It's safe to use on babies. Um, and um, you can put uh, that on your exposed skin. You don't need a lot of it, um, but you need a concentration that's at least 30 to 35 percent. Anything above 35 percent won't work any better than just 35 percent, um, but it can be a little bit more irritating to the skin. So you don't need a 100 percent deed. It's no better than 35 percent, but uh, it might dissolve your watch band. So uh, stick with the lower concentrations um, between 30 and 35 percent. Apply it evenly, but you don't need a lot of it in an area. It just needs a very thin layer, either from a spray, a pump bottle, or a cream. And um, that um, uh, needs to be, though, applied very evenly. If you miss a big spot, um, the mosquito will find it. Uh, so you can't put a dab behind each ear and think that that's going to protect you. It needs to be on the skin. Usually myself, I don't put it on my face so much um, because um, mosquitoes don't bite there as much, but they do love to go for the neck behind the ears um, and this area around here. And that's a good place to cover with your repellent. And then obviously if you have shorts on, you put it on your legs and your feet because uh, some of the mosquito species love to bite around the ankles and legs. DEET will also help protect you from chiggers, which is also another summertime pest, uh, and ticks if applied uh, on the lower extremities. 
Um, other mosquito repellents that work, um, uh, one is called Picaridin, Picaridin, and there are a few brands of that that are readily available. For that one, you, you want 20%. 20% picaridin. Some people like it better than DEET because it doesn't have that kind of chemically smell to it um, and it doesn't feel quite as greasy when it goes on, but you do have to apply it a little bit more often uh, and look at the label to see how often that should be. And then lastly, uh, there's more availability now of lemon eucalyptus oil, which sounds really nice. And yes, it does smell a bit like a lemon and that works pretty well. A lot of the other products um, that you see, um, such as citronella creams, um, some Skin So Soft that doesn't have DEET in it, um, and a lot of these other products um, don't really work that well. So if you don't mind getting bit by mosquitoes, you can go ahead and use them. But um, if you really want mosquitoes off, stick with DEET, Picaridin, and lemon eucalyptus oil. Um, what about ticks? So first of all, ticks like uh, disrupted areas, uh, grasses, um, and particularly longer grasses, brushy areas. Uh, so if you are looking to go get a tick on you, best place to go is like under power lines and walk through the grass and get into the brush. A lot of people don't do that. But, um, but a lot of people have to, um, either through their job or because they're trekking and need to get from point A to point B. Um, there are certain areas that have a lot higher tick density than others. Um, you can get ticks in your own yard. You can get it from outdoor activities such as mowing the lawn, uh, clearing brush, um, or hanging out um, in the backyard. Um, and uh, so it doesn't have to be just out on an exotic hike. Unfortunately, we do have some tick-borne infections um, here in this part of uh, North Carolina um, and between here and the mountains. Um, the uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, probably one of the more serious ones, which is a, a little rickettsia organism um, that can be uh, given by a tick bite. And then we have uh, Ehrlichia in this area that can be transmitted by a tick bite. Uh, and sometimes Lyme disease, um, which is a little bit more uncommon in our area than others, but it can be found here as well. The best way to prevent those infections is to prevent getting bitten by ticks. The best way to not get bit by a tick, it seems simple, but is to check yourself. Most of these need to be um, present, uh, those ticks need to be attached for at least 24 hours getting their blood meal to get the risk of having that, um, that disease. Um, so if you check yourself for ticks regularly um, and knock them off if they're not attached and then uh, pull them out if they are attached, uh, you can reduce your chance of getting sick from them. Um, so uh, if you're out hiking regularly and you sit down to rest, get some water, maybe have a little snack, good time to check yourself for ticks. Um, and uh, both um, if you're wearing longer pants, you have to make sure you check underneath them, roll them up and take a look. Um, the places where ticks like to go are places they're not going to get knocked off. And so behind the knees um, and along the belt line, in and around the groin um, and uh, on your back, uh, underneath your shoulder blades, up on the neck and in the hair and around the ears. So those are all places to look. Unfortunately, you can't always feel the tick crawling on you. They're very, uh, very sneaky um, uh, when they do that. Um, and so uh, you actually kind of have to take a look. Sometimes it's good to have somebody else check you for ticks and you check your friend. Um, and then when you get um, ready to get uh, washed up um, and get in the tent or come home from your hike, and check yourself well um, before going to bed um, and get undressed and take a look, uh, particularly in those areas that I just mentioned. If the tick is attached, the best way to detach it is to take a very small tweezers grab it right up against where your skin is 
and then gently pull back. Um, the last thing you want to do is grab the tick with your thumb and your forefinger, squeeze and yank because you're squeezing tick juices into you when you do that. So it actually increases your chance of getting something. So just the tweezers, pull it out gently, um, and then um, um, dispose of the tick. Uh, you can get ticks inside your house too sometimes. Most of the time it's, uh, it's the doggy who brings it in, um, and the doggy goes out and hangs out in the yard, and picks up a couple ticks, and then gets, uh, goes and lays down on its favorite spot on your couch, and, um, and then the tick can crawl off the dog and get on the couch, and then you can get it that way. So um, that's, uh, that's sort of uh, the best thing, um, I think, uh, to do when you're out um, is to just uh, try to keep the ticks off of you. I really don't recommend taking antibiotics to prevent tick-borne infections, even if you do get a tick bite. It's easier just to monitor for the early symptoms. Fortunately, all of these tick-borne infections, if treated early, um, is no big deal. Um, and um, you know, a couple, three days of symptoms and you're done. Um, so um, um, just be cognizant of it. Um, so I'll uh, ask now, are there any questions? We'll take the outdoor activity questions first. Um, so it's a big, uh, big topic, so maybe somebody thought of something that I didn't think to bring up. Nothing on this side? I get asked a lot about, well, you know, my kid swallows a lot of water at the swimming pool. Um, so is that a problem? Well, first of all, the swimming pool is a pretty safe place um, because we, uh, we halogenate, which is either chlorine or bromine, or use salt um, in, in very low, in low concentrations of salt in pools to control um, bacteria. Um, the, the one thing about um, swimming pools, though, is that um, you do swallow water, and it is possible that if the pool got contaminated for some reason um, and the chlorine levels aren't high enough, um, that you can pick something up. Um, the big ones that we track for that is a pathogen called cryptosporidium, which is a little a parasite-like organism, microscopic, and Giardia, which is another uh, parasite, microscopic, that sometimes gets in the pools. Um, where outbreaks occur due to these pathogens associated with the pools uh, are usually in water parks. Um, and because it's harder to keep the chlorine levels up when um, there's a lot of water movement. Um, the other thing is, is that People swallow water at the water parks. You're going down that slide called the vicious tornado or whatever the name is, and you're screaming and you got your mouth wide open and then splash, you hit the water down below. Um, and then that, um, then you can swallow the water that might have those in it. Uh, and you can get sick with it, uh, with the diarrheal illness. Um, so how do these little pathogens get in the water park? Oftentimes it's um, from us. And so if you didn't shower before you got into the pool or the water park and you happen to have some Giardia from your illness that you picked up somewhere else, like backpacking in the mountains, and then you go to the water park and it's on your body, it's going to get in the water and it proliferates in the warm water if it's not chlorinated. Um, one of the pathogens, cryptosporidium, is actually a little bit resistant to chlorine. So we see that sometimes even with chlorinated pools. Um, the, the other area where we see these is in wading pools, kitty wading pools, because unfortunately swim diapers are not necessarily a really good containment device uh, for um, poop. And so when kids uh, get into these pools, um, there's going to be a small amount that gets out around the diaper. So I'm, I mean, they help a lot, but, um, but yeah, it happens. And these pools are usually shallow, so they're warm, which facilitates um, propagation of these bacteria. So um, how do you prevent these infections? Best way is just don't swallow water. Um, and if you have to, keep it to a minimum. 
and uh, go to places that are well chlorinated. How do you know if it's well chlorinated? You should, f you should be able to smell it. Or you can ask the lifeguards, what do you do? You keep it salt, salt-based pools. The water will taste a little salty if you get it in your mouth. Um, and then if there happens to be a contamination of the pool that is obvious, um, then, then the lifeguards and pool people should be shocking the pool and keeping people out for a while uh, until that um, uh, disinfectant has time to work. So a little bit on the pool. Any questions otherwise that have come up? There was one about is lemon eucalyptus oil good for ticks? Is, is lemon eucalyptus is good for ticks? Uh, yeah, reasonably. The, the best thing actually for ticks to put on you is something called permethrin. And permethrin is actually an insecticide. Uh, and so it actually kills the tick, which gives you a little bit of satisfaction sometimes. Um, but you don't put that directly on your skin. So permethrin-based things, and the, the one trade name that's out there is called Permanone. And the, the hunting places oftentimes will have this, where um, outdoor outfitters that, where people uh, get hunting supplies. You don't put it directly on your skin. You put it on your clothes and your boots and your socks and your pants. Because most of the ticks around here come up from the ground. So it's when you're walking through the areas. Um, and then if a tick happens to land on your pants uh, and you've got permanone in there um, or permethrin, it'll kill that tick. The, the thing about the way to use it is you take your permethrin-based, um, either a, you can either use a spray or um, um, of the liquid that comes straight out of a drip out of the bottle. And then you soak your pants and or socks and or boots. And then, um, and then you let them air dry, put them out in the sun for 30 minutes. How much should you put on is so that the clothing piece is just damp. Um, you don't need it to be wet like coming out of the washer, but just a little bit of dampness, kind of like you've been out in a drizzle for a little bit. And then you throw it out in the sun and let it sun dry. And once you've done that, it'll stay in the clothing for two weeks. Um, and if you're going into an area where there's a lot of mosquitoes, you can do the same thing with your hiking shirt um, and with your hat. If you do it with your hat, it helps keep off the deer flies and horse flies and things too. Um, so permethrin uh, is good. Um, and uh, if you're really getting in the ticky and buggy areas, I would recommend it for your treating your clothing. All right, so um, we're going to come back next week, um, so next Thursday morning. Um, and then um, what I would like is for people to submit questions. And you can submit questions about um, COVID, uh, other viruses, other pathogens that come up, tick-borne illnesses, so on and so forth. I'll keep it kind of wide open. And, uh, and then we'll uh, answer some of these questions and maybe have a discussion about some of the things we may have missed this morning. Um, and then the following two weeks after that, Dr. Roll's going on vacation. Um, so we'll take those two weeks off and I recommend you do the same. So, uh, and hopefully everyone will have a fun and safe uh, and uh, COVID-free summer. <laughs>